If you have bills and debt piling up, a personal loan through NetCredit can provide funding up to $10,000 to help you get back on track if eligible. Visit netcredit.com today. All NetCredit loans and lines of credit are offered by a member of the NetCredit family of companies or one of our lending partners. Visit netcredit.com slash partners for more information. With bills to pay and debt piling up, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. Personal loans through NetCredit can provide funding up to $10,000 to help you get back on track financially if eligible. Our secure application process allows you to customize the terms that work for you and your budget. So check your eligibility today without affecting your credit score and help get your finances back on track. NetCredit, a more personal, personal loan. All NetCredit loans and lines of credit are offered by a member of the NetCredit family of companies or one of our lending partners. Visit netcredit.com slash partners for more information. This podcast contains adult themes and language and some of the things that we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. In this podcast, we discuss sexual assault, torture, race, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. And thank you so much for listening. Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and the victims that we don't hear or know much about. Contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight, cis, white, do they just are not i'm telling you it's true and there are many well-documented cases of serial killers of color and fruit loops is a podcast all about them we will take deep dives into the fascinating lives and crimes of serial killers and true crimes committed by people of color and the victims that the media and entertainment commonly leave out because the news is racist allegedly and we are wendy and beth she's wendy a black latinx woman and i'm beth and i just happen to be white it is not her fault (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're not journalists, investigators, or psychologists. Just a couple of gals interested in true crime. Also, the opinions expressed in this podcast are just that, our opinions. Please send any questions or comments to fruitloopspod at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 602-935-6294. 602 602-935-6294. Oh my God, we nailed we it. it. And we may feature it on a future episode. Also, our website is fruitloopspod.com and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all our social media. The footnotes for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways that you can support the show and become a Fruit Loops patron. You can also support us by supporting our sponsors. Yes, Tune in. please do. So, um, who are we talking about today, Beth? Well, today we're talking about Elias Bulizam, an Arab Israeli man living in the U.S. who was convicted of stabbing a man to death in Flint, Michigan in 2010. But he likely stabbed at least 18 people in total, killing five. Uh, before we get into it, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Status quo. Not much uh, going on around here. How are you doing? No news is good news. Same. Yeah, yeah. Um, exhausted, yeah. but uh, excited here. <laughs> to pod. Yes, indeedy. Now let's Let's get into some listener letters. Well, hello, oh, angels. Yeah. Thank <sighs> you. So what is in that bag, Beth? Well, I wanted to say thank you to Nakia for your post where mm. she said, I'm binging a podcast, Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color, and an extra, extra read all about it week of April 13th. Beth shared some advice for parents in the initial throes of COVID-19 version 1.0. <laughs> mm-hmm. I thought this was something all of us parents and caregivers should have heard then and so many of us need to hear daily. I hope you open your hearts and can find something you need to hear in this. And she says, I'm only saying that as a parent, I needed to hear this. So um, I don't know if that one is available on our feed. I I guess so. Because usually those are those are our patron only episodes. The extra. Yeah, but we do release some Some of them them. sometimes uh, for a little taste. But um, I thought it was really nice of Nikia to comment on the wise words of our OG (laughs) of 
true crime and of life. And I, I remember, I, I mean, I remember that episode really well because it was right. It was like in the, the, right, the beginning and, yeah. and it was a nightmare. Yeah. And they were Beth's asking really parents to take on all these jobs, like being a teacher, being a parent, working and, it, and having a full time job. It was, too, yeah, it was impossible. it's yeah. impossible. It's impossible. Yeah, yeah. So um, we all needed to hear it, Nakia. And we thank you for yeah, saying thank you, thank thank you, you so to much. Beth because she is priceless. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we got a new Patreon. All right. Uh, her name is Carrie D. Hey, so Carrie, Carrie D. D, here's your tune. Carrie D is the best new fruity. Ow, ow. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. I do the Carrie D. Watch me do the Carrie D. Ow, ow. Carrie, baby. Uh, and that is for you, Carrie D. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to take a quick break and get into the story when we come back. Okay, we're back. Remind us, Beth, who is our subject today? Today we're talking about Elias Abulazam, the serial stabber, alleged to have stabbed at least 18 people in what may have been racially motivated attacks between May 2010 and August 2010. That it just bothered me the whole time researching this story. May have been racially motivated. Okay, let's get yeah, into the stat. Yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Elias Abuelazam, uh, a.k.a. the Flint Serial Slasher and the Serial Stabber, um, his surname is a contraction of Abu El Azam, which in Arabic means father of Azam. Azam is a boy's name of Arabic origin, meaning great. Um, all of Abu El Azam's uh, alleged victims were described as small framed, for example, short, thin, non-muscular men. Um, Abu El Azam was six feet, five inches. And uh, for those small Smarty pants, not on uh, America's system, 1.96 meters in height. And he weighed 280 pounds, 130 kilograms at the time of his booking. Um, 16 of the victims were black. One was a dark skinned Latinx man and one was white. Abuel Azam was alleged to have stabbed at least 18 people from May 2010 to August 2010. So very short window in yeah. Michigan, Virginia and Ohio. Uh, 14 of these people were in the Flint, Michigan area. Five of them died. The names of the five who died rest in power to all of those that were killed and the um, prayers up to those that survived yeah. and the loved ones and communities in the wake of this case. Um, the murder victims are David Motley, 31, Emmanuel Abdul Muhammad, 59, Darwin Marshall, 43, Frank Kelly Brew, 60, and Arnold Minor, who was 49. So now we're going to get into the setting. Take us there, Beth. So although the crimes were committed in the United States, Abu Lazam was born in Israel, officially the state of Israel, which is located between Egypt and Jordan along the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea. The seeds for the state of Israel were planted by the Zionist movement, which was a movement to create a Jewish homeland. The fundamental philosophies of the Zionist movement have existed for hundreds of years. At first, it was a fringe idea. Jewish people lived all over the world, and most of them had no intention of leaving their homes in Europe or elsewhere. Modern Zionism formally took root in the 19th century. Around that time, Jews throughout the world faced growing anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is an old and widespread prejudice that has taken many forms throughout history. In the 19th century, some people actively promoted the view that Jews were responsible for many social and political ills in modern industrial society. Pogrom is a Russian word generally translated as desolation or devastation. A pogrom is a violent riot incited with the aim of massacring or expelling an ethnic or religious group, particularly Jews. Russian pogroms swept the southern and western provinces of the Russian Empire between 1881 and 1884, although the first such incident to be labeled a pogrom is believed to be anti-Jewish rioting in Odessa in 1821. Similar attacks against Jews also occurred at other times and places which retrospect 
retrospectively became known as pogroms. Persecuted Jews began actively promoting the idea of returning to the Palestine region, which they considered to be their homeland, and creating a Jewish state there. In 1917, during World War I, British troops captured Jerusalem with the Ottoman Empire. In 1922, the League of Nations awarded Britain an international mandate to administer Palestine during the post-war deal-making that redrew the map of the eastern Mediterranean. They just redrew the map. Yeah, they just redrew the map. (laughs) The award of the mandate also endorsed the 1917 Balfour Declaration, in which Britain expressed support for a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Jewish people began to move there and buy up land. Under the British, the early Zionist movement was able to lay the groundwork for what would become modern Israel. But between 1922 and 1947, large-scale Jewish immigration, mainly from Eastern Europe, took place. The numbers swelled in the 1930s with Nazi persecution. During this time, as Jewish immigration and Jewish Arab tension increased, the British tried to sharply limit Jewish immigration into the area. Then came the Holocaust, the systemic state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million European Jews by the German Nazi regime and its allies and collaborators. Between 1941 and 1945, Nazi Germany and its collaborators systematically murdered around two-thirds of Europe's Jewish population. Two-thirds. Wow. In May of 1945, Allied powers defeated Nazi Germany, ending World War II. While the Holocaust ended with the war, the legacy of terror and genocide did not. Six million Jews and millions of others were dead. Thousands of Jewish communities across Europe had been devastated or completely destroyed. In addition, many Holocaust survivors still faced ongoing threats of violence, anti-Semitism, and displacement as they sought to build new lives. In 1947, in large part a reaction to the chaos and violence in British Palestine, the UN hoped to solve the problem by dividing the territory. The UN adopted a partition plan for a two-state solution in British Palestine. The plan was accepted by the Jewish leadership, but rejected by the Arab leaders, who saw it as European colonial theft. And in 1948, the British withdrew. On the eve of final British withdrawal on May 14, 1948, the Jewish Agency of Israel, headed by David Ben-Gurion declared the establishment of the State of Israel according to the proposed UN plan. U.S. President Harry S. Truman recognized the new nation on the same day. This resulted in the Arab-Israeli war and the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict, one of the world's most enduring conflicts, which still exists today. Within Israeli and Palestinian society, the conflict generates a wide variety of views and opinions. Mutual distrust and significant disagreements run deep. It is therefore difficult to develop a single objective reason for the conflict, but at its most basic level, the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians is over who gets what land and how that land is controlled. The borders between Israel and Palestine have been disputed and fought over since 1948. Israelis and Palestinians have very different narratives of the conflict with what's happened, what matters, and who bears what responsibilities. Some Israelis view Palestinians as usurpers and conquerors, whereas some Palestinians view the Israelis as colonialist oppressors. Many Israelis believe that the conflict is largely a result of Arab attempts to destroy Israel and that only Israeli military power stands between them and annihilation, whereas many Palestinians believe Israel wants to drive them out entirely and they are bent on ethnic cleansing. Although peace talks have been going on for decades, a lack of trust has led to hopelessness in the peace process, which in turn has contributed to both sides resorting to violence. Although the state of Israel is officially a Jewish country, people of other religions do live there as well, and those other religions are tolerated. The religion breakdown in Israel in 2019 was 74% Judaism, 18% Islam, 2% Christianity, 2% Druze, and 4% other religions. Religions. Ethnically, it breaks down to 74% Jewish, 21% non Jewish Arab, and 5% other. Oh, welcome to Culture Corner with Minnie. <laughs> Hello, Minnie. Yeah, <laughs> so Minnie used to live in Israel for, she lived there for, I don't know, uh, almost a year, I think. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. 
cool. And she says, it might seem a bit confusing to use Jewish as both a religion and an ethnicity to specify some Arabs as non-Jewish and not any as Jewish Arabs, but the history of the area and the people is complicated. Arab Jews is a term for Jews originating from the Arab world. The term is politically contested, often by Zionists or by Jews with roots in the Arab world, who prefer to be identified as Mizrahi Jews. Many left or were expelled from Arab countries in the decades following the founding of Israel in 1948 and took up residence in Israel, Western Europe, the United States, and Latin America. Jews living in Arab-majority countries historically mostly used various Judeo-Arabic dialects in their primary community language, with the Hebrew language used for worship and cultural purposes, literature, philosophy, poetry, etc. Many aspects of their culture have commonality with local non-Jewish Arab populations. Though Golda Meir, in an interview as late as 1972, explicitly referred to Jews from Arab countries as Arab Jews, the use of the term is controversial, as the vast majority of Jews with origins in Arab-majority countries do not identify as Arabs, and Jews who lived amongst Arabs did not call themselves Arab Jews or view themselves as such. In recent decades, some Jews have self-identified as Arab Jews, such as Ella Shohat, who uses the term in contrast to the Zionists' categorization of Jews as either Ashkenazim or Mizrahim. The latter, she believes, have been oppressed as the Arabs have. Other Jews, such as Albert Memi, say that Jews in Arab countries would have liked to be Arab Jews, but centuries of oppression by Arab Muslims prevented it. And now it's too late. The term is mostly used by post-Zionists and Arab nationalists. As the term is still so politically and emotionally charged for people, we won't be using it. And that is it for Culture Corner (laughs) with (laughs) According to a Pew Research Center survey of religion in Israel, most Israeli Jews do not believe that intolerance is a major problem in Israel, even when it comes to their frequently tense relations with the country's Arab population. By contrast, roughly four in five Israeli Arabs, or 79%, say there is a lot of discrimination against Muslims. Arabs are also more likely than Jews to perceive Israeli society as discriminatory toward a variety of other social and demographic groups. Around the time when Elias was born in Israel in the city of Ramla, the population was about 35,000, but it was growing rapidly, almost doubling in population by 2001. In 2001, the ethnic makeup of the city was 80% Jewish, 16% Muslim Arab, and 4% Christian Arab. It's worth mentioning that Ramla had originally been intended to become part of an Arab state back in 1947 during the time of the establishment of Israel as a nation, but its great location along a trade route from the coast of the Mediterranean Sea to Jerusalem made it a focus of dispute. And ultimately, it was captured during the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. At this point, the majority of the non-Jewish Arabs who had been living in the area either left or were driven out, putting those who remained into the category of minorities. So now we're going to get into Elias Abuelazam's early life. Hit it, Beth. Elias Abulazam was born on August 29th, 1976 in Ramla, Israel, to Christian Arab parents. Elias's family, being Christian Arab, would have fallen into the category of minorities within the state of Israel. We don't know if his family was originally from Ramla or if his ancestors had participated in the conflict, but it's certainly possible that they were affected by generational trauma, if that were the case. Definitely. Yeah. Elias likely attended private school in Israel, as any of the public schools would have included instruction in Judaism. Most non-Jews in Israel do send their children to private schools, so there's a good chance that that was part of Elias's childhood as well. When Elias was still a toddler, his father died. He was the youngest of six children with five older sisters. And uh, one of the videos that I watched or something that I read or listened to or watched, Mm -hmm. they said that his parents kept trying for a boy. And that's why... They oh, had they had that, five girls wow. and then they then they finally had a boy. And yeah, five success. Finally, <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> and there was a suggestion that as the only boy, he might have been spoiled. Though with his father dying when he was that young and growing up as a minority in a politically charged country, it's difficult to imagine that his childhood was that great. Some have described his family as well off, though money doesn't buy happiness. Okay, agree to disagree. <laughs> Just ask. Ken- 
me at Aula. Oh, wait, maybe don't ask her because she probably still believes that it does. <laughs> No, who is Kemi Adeyula? We covered her. Um, oh, that's right. The that's British, right. British girl. That's her right. Dad was. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. I remember now. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that was for you guys, the listeners, yeah. not me. Um, anyway, so when Elias was seven, his mother remarried and took him with her to live in the U.S. He lived with family in a variety of places in California, Florida, Virginia, and Israel over the next several years. Though his mother ultimately moved back to Ramla. He moved from one set of relatives to another over the years, living as something of a nomad. His upbringing clearly lacked stability. In 1995, when he was 19 years old, he lived in Grand Blanc. I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced in Michigan. <laughs> Grand hmm. Blanc. <laughs> Grand Blanc. Um, well, it just sounds like it's the Great Grand White. Blanc. The Big White. Yeah, great. The Big White. Big White. The Big White in Michigan. And is, isn't that what, isn't that? Yes, isn't, isn't Big there White. there a lot of snow yep. in terms of climate and yes. people? in Michigan. Yes. I don't know. I don't know. But that's my thought. Yeah, I think it's uh, true. Except, except for, for the Great Migration. Yeah, spots. The, the, the cities like Detroit mm-hmm. and Flint. Those yeah. are majority black, I believe. Mm-hmm, or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if not majority black, there's at least a, a large population a large of population. black people. Anyway, <laughs> Grand Blanc, or however it's pronounced, is a suburb of Flint. And so he went there in 1995, and then he went back to Israel. In 1997, while he was in Israel, he tried to commit suicide. He was admitted mm. to a psychiatric facility where a doctor diagnosed him as psychotic. After this, he returned to the U.S. At some point, he acquired a green card so that he could work in the U.S., but he never became a U.S. citizen. With bills to pay and debt piling up, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. Personal loans through NetCredit can provide funding up to $10,000 to help you get back on track financially if eligible. Our secure application process allows you to customize the terms that work for you and your budget. So check your eligibility today without affecting your credit score and help get your finances back on track. NetCredit, a more personal, personal loan. All NetCredit loans and lines of credit are offered by a member of the NetCredit family of companies or one of our lending partners. Visit netcredit.com partners for more information. So now we're going to get into the timeline. What do you got for us, Beth? After returning to the U.S., Abulazam had several run-ins with the law, including several traffic violations, a check fraud charge, and unlawful possession of a weapon. Although he drifted a bit, he did seem to try to settle down in Northern Virginia for several years, sometimes living with his sister in Leesburg. He worked at Piedmont Behavioral Health Center, a psychiatric facility in Leesburg, as a mental health technician. He married twice while in Virginia. Uh, well, Virginia is the state of for lovers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and his first marriage was to Don Costello in Fairfax County, Virginia in 1997. They separated in 2000 and were divorced in 2002. His second marriage was to Jessica Nimitz in Leesburg, Virginia in 2004. They later separated and ultimately divorced in 2007. He ended up leaving his job at Piedmont Behavioral Health after being injured on the job in 2002. In 2008, he was convicted of lying on a handgun permit application and served about a month in jail, reportedly because he failed to disclose a 1995 fraud charge from California. In 2009, while visiting Ramla, he stabbed a friend in the neck with a screwdriver. Oh, once that it was a fa- the face. Uh, well, somewhere around that area, anyway. Somewhere <laughs> above the shoulders. Either way, it yeah, sucks. Yeah, somewhere over there, yeah. But his friend elected not to press charges, so he was not convicted of anything as a result. Beth, if you stabbed me in the face with a screwdriver, I don't know if I would press charges either. <laughs> Well, I hope you do, because something ain't right. <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't I see know. myself stabbing I, I anybody just, in, in my, the face. In my head, in my, because it would be so weird, I would just think, oh, Beth was just Beth, having a bad day. Beth, I'll be fine. Beth's losing her shit. Yeah, yeah. She just needs she just needs prayer and support. That's what I would, that's what I would go with it. Um, in in May of 2010, when he was 33, Abulazam went back to Flint, Michigan after a fist fight with his brother-in-law forced him to move out of his sister's home. He moved into a house 
owned by his uncle, Tony Sawani, who lived in the house next door. Sawani acted as somewhat of a patriarch for the family. While living in Flint, Sawani found Abu Lazam a job at King Water Market in Beecher, Michigan, where he worked from July 5th to August 1st, 2010, so just a month. Okay. Customer there knew him as Eli. His uncle also bought him a dark green Chevy Blazer with tan or gold lower side paneling for Abu Lazam to use. And I say tan or gold because it's been reported as one or the other in different sources. All right. Um... Sounds like a hell of a ride. Uh, It was not long after he moved to Flint that the stabbings began. Starting in May 2010, several stabbings occurred in and around Flint, Michigan, under circumstances that indicated it was the same person committing the attacks. Each of the stabbings occurred on deserted streets during the early morning hours. Most of the victims were black males, ranging in age from 17 to 60, and a dark green SUV with tan or gold side panels was frequently seen nearby. The driver would lure the men to his SUV by asking for directions or help with car trouble. Then, when they approached to assist, he would stab them. Some of the men collapsed at the scene, others fled, but the perpetrator never pursued, just watched and then got in his car and left. The victims were not robbed either. Creepy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. On May 24th, 2010, David Motley, 31, was found stabbed to death around 6 a.m. near Leith and Dexter in Flint. This was only a few blocks from where Abu Zam was living on Maryland Avenue. On June 21st, Emmanuel Abdul Muhammad, 59, was found dead about 2 a.m. near Avenue B and Wood Street in Flint. On June 26th, Bill Fisher, 42, was attacked around 5.50 a.m. on Pearson Road near Cleo. He survived. On June 12th, Antoine Jackson, then 29, was stabbed at around 1.30 a.m. near Saginaw. Uh, It took me four days to hitchhike from Saginaw. (laughs) I've gone. I always wondered what that was. It's a place in the Midwest. Anyway, uh... Antoine Jackson, 29, was stabbed around 1.30 a.m. near Saginaw Street and Maple Road in Burton, a suburb of Flint. He survived. On July 19th, Richard Booker was attacked about 12.15 a.m. near North Saginaw and Julia Avenue in Genesee Township. Booker was stabbed five times, including a roughly 12-inch long vertical slash from below his belly button all the way up his chest. Whoa. He lost eight pints of blood from his wounds, but he survived. He was the only white victim. Wow. And this is this is how this guy stabbed them, a, a lot of the victims. He would stab them in the belly and then pull the knife up into their chest. Shh. Yeah. Beth, can I tell you how surprised I am that, that I you said that? detailed that you <laughs> gave that detail? I know you don't like that I stuff. I don't, but it's My just mouth- so shocking. And some it of the is. some of the victims described being lifted off the ground. <gasps> yeah. Oh my Santa Maria. I wow. Yeah. Um wow. Uh wow. I don't know what to say. <laughs> um you know what else is creepy is that he would just stand watch there and watch and not pursue. Yeah. Yeah. Um and there's this TikTok challenge where people are like I bet you can't get away from a serial killer oh, and geez. so it's um it's people like uh getting out of their car and running to their door and the serial killer is just pretend just walking right just casually walking and they don't make it oh my god they don't make it to their, i mean it's it's a challenge right. and it's, it's it's fake obviously right. but, but uh still, just the idea that yeah. you're frantically moving or and, something and really terrifying is happening and this person yeah. is just chilling watching yeah. is very both it's chilling. very chilling yeah yeah, absolutely. So um, and I'm not good at words, but Beth just agreed with me. So I win. <laughs> anyway, he required 68 staples throughout his back and belly. He had slash wounds on his arms because he said he was trying to prevent the man from, quote, cutting off his face, unquote. Jeez. On July 23rd, a 21-year-old man was stabbed about 5.45 a.m. on University Avenue near King Avenue. He survived. On July 26, Darwin Marshall, 43, was pronounced dead at Hurley Medical Center after he was found stabbed at about 1.30 a.m. July 26 on Garland Street near West Fifth Avenue. He had died from blood loss as his aorta had been cut during the stabbing. And though they tried their best, the response team was unable to save him. That's like 
seven or eight stabbings just in the month of July. Yeah. And we're not even done with July yet. Right. And it, it's Ooh. like almost every night, you know? Yeah. Holy shit. So on July 27th, Antoine Marshall, then 26 years old, was attacked at about 3 a.m. near Pearson and Fleming. He was stabbed six times in his stomach and chest, but he survived. On July 29th, Devon Rawls, 20, was stabbed around 3.30 a.m. at Leith and Cook Streets. He also survived. On July 29th, uh, Bulazam was cited for giving alcohol to a minor. The same day, a 59-year-old man was stabbed in Flint, Michigan. The man was stabbed at about 6 a.m. near Saginaw and 12th Streets. He survived. So he was in police custody or arrested? No, he was just, just given he was ticket. given a ticket. He was working at the the market, the King King oh, that's Water right. Market. Got a good yeah. Job. And mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. so he sold alcohol to a minor and uh so he got got in trouble for that. On July 30th, Frank Kelly Brew, 60 years old, was stabbed to death around 3.30 a.m. near Hometown Inn on Miller Road in Flint Township. This was the 11th attack, the one that convinced police that a serial killer was on the loose. It took 11 attacks. Yeah. I wonder why. What does Wendy always say every week? <laughs> uh, starts with the R, ends with the acism. Anyway, sketches of a possible suspect soon were posted around Genesee County. On July 30th, a 28-year-old was stabbed around 6 a.m. on South Saginaw Street near West 2nd Street. He survived. On August 1st, Etwan Wilson, 17, was attacked about 2.30 a.m. near Pearson and Basil in Flint. Etwan was walking alone in the area of Cloverlawn Drive and Pearson Road. Etwan later described that a large man in a green over gold SUV was pulled over on the side of the road. He motioned Etwan over to the vehicle, asking for directions. When Etwan approached, the man pounced stabbing him in the stomach. Etwan was able to get away and was taken to the hospital where he was given the care he needed to survive the attack. So um, I think it was Etwan who described him as looking like a wrestler. Like he, he was just a really big <gasps> oh, guy. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm picturing like The Rock. Yeah. Yeah. Just a really yeah. big guy and, and muscular. Yeah. 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 On August 2nd, at about 2.30 a.m., Arnold Minor, 49, was found stabbed on South Saginaw Street near Barton Street in Flint. A police officer driving near Atherton Road in Flint discovered Arnold lying on the ground. Arnold had been stabbed twice, once in the lower chest area and once in the abdomen. He was bleeding heavily, struggling to breathe, and managed to gasp to the officer, Help me, I'm dying. Although he was taken to the hospital, he ultimately died from his wounds. The only information about his attack was that he that he was able to relay to the police was that he thought his attacker was a white man. Video surveillance from a nearby market showed a partially green SUV driving to and leaving from the crime scene. Police detective Randy Kimes, who is investigating the July 30th stabbing death of Frank Kelly Brew, went to the scene of Arnold Miner's murder and immediately saw similarities. Kimes consulted with Flint police who agreed with him. The county's police chiefs convened an emergency meeting. Uh, I'm just imagining what this is like. <laughs> Fellas, uh, so at the t- at the meeting, authorities learned about additional stabbings. Fellas, there's been additional stabbings. <laughs> Burton had, that's what police, that's how police talk to each other, right? They right, right. Like, Fellas. Uh, so Burton had a stabbing on July 12th and Genesee Township had one on July 19th. And the circumstances of the stabbings were nearly identical. Identical. Both victims had survived. Police went public with information regarding Arnold Miner's attacker, providing the vehicle information as well as the composite sketch that had been drawn after one of the previous stabbings. Side note, uh-huh. uh, I've been watching the Americans, right. and they've been doing composite sketches of, of the, <laughs> the, the Americans. Yeah. Now you are an artiste, my friend. Yes. Um, any um career or future for you in? composite sketch drawings. No, no. I, I thought about doing that kind of work, but I think it it would be too stressful. Like trying oh. to I would care too much about it. Oh uh, like, that's why uh, I work in a job or it does <laughs> 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 No, I mean it, it's important work, but it's like nobody's nobody's gonna die. It's not <laughs> really life or death. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I feel you. I feel yeah. you. I feel you. I just um was wondering about that with the uh, composite. Yeah, I sketches. did think about it and I also thought about doing the um 
recreations with clay and stuff like with that. Clay. Yeah. And oh, and now they do the, the renderings with, with computers. All that stuff yeah. is really cool. Yeah. Somebody should send us to a seminar. Or you yeah. at least. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so, and just as suddenly as the attacks began, they stopped. With the public announcement, it apparently got too hot for Abul Azam. He told his bosses he was going to go visit his family in Virginia, then left Flint and drove to Leesburg, where his sister still lived. And then on August 3rd, Anthony Cage, 15, was taking a nighttime jog in Leesburg, Virginia, when a man stabbed him in the back without saying a word. Mm. He survived. On August 5th, at about 1.15 a.m., Abul Azam was arrested during a traffic stop in Arlington County, Virginia, on an outstanding warrant from Leesburg for a misdemeanor assault on his former brother-in-law. When police searched his car, they found a knife and a hammer. However, <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> the warrant had nothing to do with the stabbings and Arlington police had no reason to suspect Abulazam as a serial stabber. So he was released on his own recognizance not long after he was brought in. I feel Guess like a happens. knife and a hammer <laughs> in the car. Is, um, yeah, not a good sign. Y- I'm not a I'm not an officer, so what do I know? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, just after six a.m. the that same morning, same morning, a sixty-seven year old man was sitting on the stoop outside of his apartment, minding his own, his damn own home. goddamn business. <laughs> yep, in Leesburg, when he was stabbed by a person thought by police to be the same person who had attacked Anthony two days earlier. The attack occurred not far from where Anthony had been stabbed. He survived as well. So this guy's. Uh, ratcheting up, you know. Yeah, it, yeah, getting more and more, more daring. Yeah. I mean, somebody and in the in the oh, go ahead. Like every every other day, you know, he's he's yeah. stabbing somebody. Yeah, and I wonder what's going on in his life. Like, what kinds of conversations is he having with his family? Ooh, that lasagna was delicious. Thanks. Hey, want to go play basketball? Like, is he is he still going yeah. to the gym? Yeah. Is what is he eating for what lunch is he and dinner? Doing? Yeah. Is he drinking enough water? What's going on? <laughs> anyway, I'm yeah. curious. Yeah, I I do wonder about that a lot. Like serial killers, what are their what's their normal what's the day to day? Yeah, the day to day. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. And then and yeah. then he goes out in the morning and kills somebody. You know? Yeah. I mean, what's his sleep pattern? like is he does he use an alarm clock what does he eat for breakfast does he eat fruit loops cereal i don't know i mean i'm just really curious yeah yeah i'm curious too anyway (laughs) on august 6 a 19 year old man was in a leesburg parking lot when someone asked for help fixing his chevy blazer when the teenager approached the man struck him on the head with a hammer he survived. That attack was recorded by a security camera providing investigators with an image of both the suspect and the vehicle. Hammer is such a hell of a tool. Yeah. So useful. So <laughs> dangerous. Uh, Leesburg Police Chief Joseph R. Price said that he was confident that the attacks were racially motivated, explaining that the area is 83 percent white, which makes it unusual that two of the victims there were black and one was dark skinned Hispanic. Yeah. And uh, Flint and around Flint, where those stabbings took place, um, as we said before, the there was there's a large black population Uh, there. So it's not not that unusual. But what is unusual is the stabbings. Because normally, yeah. or not normally, but most of the homicides that take place there apparently are um, gun gun violence. gun violence, right? Not mm-hmm, stabbings. Mm-hmm. So the stabbings yeah. were unusual. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and it is also unusual to me um, when you look at across racial lines. Yeah. Um, that um, that that in, sort of getting that intimate with um, somebody that you don't know that well or who's completely different than you. Um, I don't know what it means, but it just sticks out. Of yeah, my mind. It's yeah, it does. Unusual. Right. On August 7th, 59-year-old Tony Lino was taking a smoke break outside of the Toledo, Ohio church where he worked when he was attacked and stabbed. He survived. So Toledo, so, Ohio. Toledo, Ohio. Holy Toledo. Holy Toledo. By the way, yeah. I heard an interesting um, comment about Ohio, that Ohio is great if you could get out of it. <laughs> I don't know much about <laughs> I don't know much about Ohio, uh, but uh, I thought that that, that was is quite funny. an interesting I would say that comment about Texas. 
<laughs> so any of our listeners who have Florida. great things to say about Ohio, Florida, or Texas, please get at us. Educate us. What's so great about Ohio? Anyway, uh, now we're going to get into the investigation and the arrest. So Flint police had informed a task force and an anonymous tip line was set up. By then, investigators had been made aware of the similar attacks that happened in Leesburg, Virginia, and Toledo, Ohio. Toledo is located between Leesburg and Flint, so officers believed that the killer was on his way back to Flint. In the meantime, Antoine Marshall, who had been stabbed on July 27th and had been recovering in the ICU, woke up. He was able to give the police more information about the killer, specifically that he was, quote, not all white, unquote. Antoine told officers that he didn't know what race the man was, but that the attacker had olive skin. The 314th tip called in to the task force tip line was from a woman who said her father worked at Kingwater Market and a man that worked, or a man that he worked with known as Eli drove a similar vehicle and kind of looked like that composite sketch. He also recently left for Virginia. Police spoke to the owner of Kingwater Market. That owner didn't know Eli's full name because he always paid him in cash and nobody else oh. there knew what his last name was either. Okay. Uh, but one of the other employees did have his phone number. And so police got that. And they were finally able to get Abu Lazam's full name when they discovered that he'd been cited for selling alcohol to a minor while working at the market. So that's got him. We talked about that earlier. Yeah, that's right. On August 10th, Abu Lazam's uncle, Tony Sawani, later claiming that he had been fed a story that Abu Lazam was in a bar fight and didn't want to go to work because he was afraid that the person he had been in the fight with would call police, bought him a $3,000 plane ticket Yikes. to Israel. Wow. That is an expensive <laughs> plane ticket. Wow. Uh, yeah, it is. I, I didn't even... I, <laughs> That is a hell of a plane ticket. hell of a plane ticket. If, cost, <laughs> if Crime Con cost $3,000, we would <laughs> never, never go. go. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> bought him a $3,000 plane ticket to Israel, basically telling him that his free ride was over and he should get the fuck out. But uh, <laughs> did the sources say if? <laughs> or are you trying was, to make our show, <laughs> our show family friendly? <laughs> this is a family friendly murder show. <laughs> Come on, kids. <laughs> Get the F out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on August 11th, 2010, Sawani and Abu Lazam sped out of their Flint neighborhood in separate cars. They drove to a home in Burton, where they left a blazer in a driveway, then traveled together to the Detroit airport in Sawani's vehicle. The same day, police were able to begin tracking Abu Lazam via his phone. At first, they got nothing, but then his phone pinged around Louisville, Kentucky. Police then, I love these cell phone ping stories. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's kind of like DNA's uh, yeah. not as hot younger sister. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. So police then realized that they had a problem. Their suspect was either fleeing by car or he was headed to the airport in Louisville. If their suspect was planning on escaping via plane, he might be headed for Israel and they needed to get a warrant for him as fast as they could. They scrambled to put one together and find a judge to sign it. They also notified the U.S. Customs and Border Protection or CBP. Now, when this... Uh, th my memory, I remember when this, this happened? case heating up. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, I, I just remember the news reports. And I because I had a conversation with m my mother because um, they were trying to get him to Israel. And I think I don't know if you can if Israel has an extradition policy or not. My impression was it did not. So yeah, if they he were, went there, they couldn't, they couldn't get, him, get back. him back. Yeah, that's what the, all the people were saying was like, he yeah. cannot get on this plane because if he gets on this plane, he is gone. Out of here. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, we've had conversations in my family that if one of us did something terrible, 
we might get a one way ticket to, to back to my, yeah. my mother's homeland where they <laughs> can't get up. <laughs> Bye. Uh, but we would. I, I'm pretty sure none no, of us would ever gonna, do this. Not planning on so, it anyway. Not. Ne- yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, a CBP officer discovered that Abu Lazam was on his way home to Israel, booked on a Delta Airlines flight that went from Detroit to Louisville, Kentucky, to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, largest uh, largest busiest airport in the yeah. United States, and then to Tel Aviv, Israel. As police were putting together the warrant, Abu Lazam got on his flight in Louisville, headed to Atlanta. Police finally got the warrant signed when Abu Lazam was in the Atlanta airport, just Whoa. minutes away from boarding a flight to Tel Aviv. Oh, my yeah, God. It, it, the way they were describing it on one of the shows, they're like running all over the place and calling people and just like yeah. freaking out. Yeah. And I remember the um, footage, the news footage from the airport scene when they got him. Oh, wow. Yeah, I don't remember this case at all when it happened. I just remember that part because of the conversation I had with my mother about extraditing one of us. (laughs) Where to go? Necessary. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) America does does not do great things to when you're a person of color. So yeah, you know, gotta have an escape plan. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. (laughs) So CBP officers were then given the go ahead to arrest Abulazam. Airport employees paged Abulazam over the intercom, and when he came to the desk, he was taken into custody without incident while his flight to Tel Aviv was boarding. Denied. Wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the weakest link. So Abulazam's Abula luggage was recovered from Louisville, Kentucky Airport. It was later learned that Arnold Miner's blood DNA was found inside on items of clothing, as well as Abulazam's Chevy Blazer. On August 13th, Abulazam waived his right to fight extradition from Georgia to Michigan. At his extradition hearing, there were conflicting descriptions given as to his personality. Co-workers at the Piedmont Behavioral Health Center in Leesburg, Virginia, described him as nice, gentle, and patient. However, they didn't know much about his private life. They didn't socialize with him outside of work, and their conversations with him had always been casual. Abulazam's family in Ramla, his immigration lawyer, and his ex-wife Jessica expressed shock that he would be a suspect in these crimes, describing him as a good person. Overall, Jessica said he was a sweet man. However, Jessica's father, James Hurth, said he was abusive. According to him, Abulazam was rough with his daughter before the couple divorced in 2000. 2007, saying, quote, there was a bit of abuse, unquote. Uh, and Mini, <laughs> Mini says, a bit of abuse? I kind of wonder <laughs> yeah. what that means. I mean, to me, there's either there's abuse or there isn't. I feel like yeah. there's no such thing as a bit of abuse. It implies right. that a certain amount of abuse is acceptable. It isn't. Thank you, Mini yeah. Bars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think there's any such thing as a bit of abuse or kind of abusive. It either is or, or it, it isn't. Like it, Ew, or it, it isn't. can't be yeah. uh, kind of pregnant. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Genius. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You are right. OG True Crime comes through every time. Minnie and Beth, everybody. They're here all week. Hang on a second. <laughs> Yeah, 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 definitely. So uh, his family in Ramla, whom he had visited before the attack, said that at the time of the visit, he seemed tense, unhappy and confused as to what to do with his life. On August 26, 2010, Abu Lazam was charged with three counts of murder and six counts of assault with intent to murder. At his arraignment, he was ordered held without bond by the judge, even after the prosecutor asked for $10 million bail. So he was like, nope, this guy's not getting out. Sorry. Which is denied. probably yeah. a good decision. Um, he was most definitely a flight risk. I mean, the motherfucker was he at was the Atlanta airport, y'all. Israel. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Come on. And I don't Come say on. this often, but good, good job, Judge. Good job. Uh, so now we're going to get into the trial. So it was decided to try Abu Lazam for Arnold Miner's murder first. And the charges for the other attacks were put on hold, awaiting the result of this trial. And I kind of get the strategy yeah, there. Yeah. Because you, you never know. And you um, can hold those back if he doesn't, if, if this one doesn't, right. you know, if he's found not guilty. Right even charge him with another one you know exactly but it is it is, it is uh, from a victim standpoint a, a it's disservice very frustrating 
to them. Yeah, and frustrating. So on May 8th, 2012, about two years after the attacks in Flint began, the trial for the murder of Arnold Minor finally commenced. Abulazam admitted to the murder but pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. A forensic scientist testified about the blood DNA evidence. Arnold Minor's blood had been found on Abulazam's shoes and jeans and on the steering wheel and floor of Abulazam's Chevy Blazer. A Michigan State Police trooper testified regarding cell phone evidence, which placed Abulazam in the area where Arnold was stabbed, as well as the location of other attacks. Four of the surviving victims testified and identified Abulazam as their attacker, which is powerful. Yeah. The survivors talked about how Abulazam asked for directions or help with his vehicle before attacking them. Abulazam's attorneys presented an, an insanity defense. Their sole witness was psychiatrist Dr. Norman Miller. The defense claimed that Abulazam was a paranoid schizophrenic who thought that evil forces were putting spells on him and forcing him to kill, and that he didn't know that what he was doing was wrong. Interesting. <laughs> The prosecutor, the prosecution responded by attacking Dr. Miller's credibility, noting that his field of expertise was drug and alcohol addiction treatment. They presented three of their expert witnesses who disagreed with the paranoid schizophrenic diagnoses. And that's just a commentary on the system. The DA and the prosecutors have all the resources in the world. So they had three medical expert witnesses and the defense only had the one one. yeah that could be because they could only find one mm, probably not but you know it could be i don't know experts aren't free and uh so i I, that you're right it could have been because they couldn't find one who was supportive exactly but uh you pay an expert enough money they'll say whatever you want in court true Uh, And uh, so it's just interesting to me that they had so that this is clear where the state has a lot more resources at at, at their hands than than the defendants do. And that's why the system sucks. And I hate it here. Anyway, (laughs) they said that although they did think that Abulazim has an unspecified personality disorder, his attacks were too planned out and organized for him to be considered legally insane. The prosecution argued that Abulazim exhibited planning, control and a lack of empathy. He would clock out at work before heading out into the night to troll for victims. His attacks occurred after midnight with no witnesses around and the victims were carefully selected, indicating that the attacks were not impulsive. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, So on May 22nd, 2012, after one hour of deliberation, by the way, these jurors get lunch, bathroom breaks, so an hour of deliberation That's like nothing. isn't that long. They went back and said, "Yep, he's yeah. guilty," and then they, yeah. and then they went yeah. to the bathroom and <laughs> yeah, hung out. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I haven't served on a jury yet. I'm dying to, but my, I imagine there wasn't a ton of deliberation. Right. That, that hour might not might have been filled with other things. Anyway, the jury found Abulazam guilty of first degree premeditated murder, and on June 25th. 2012, Abulazam was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of 49-year-old Arnold Minor. As Michigan does not offer parole to these convicted of first-degree murder, it will be a true life sentence. Hmm. Before the sentence was announced, Arnold Minor's mother, Elzora, 68, collapsed and had to be carried out of court. Outside Mm -hmm. court, Elzora said she felt overwhelmed and fell when she looked over at Abulazam and saw him grin. What? Yeah, yikes. <laughs> uh, wow, uh, golly, he grinned at her? Yeah. Ugh, yeah. That is gross. I know. Cre- what Again. A fucking creepy. Crick. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Satan, is that you? <laughs> um, Bulletin was given a chance to speak, but said nothing about the murder because of the life sentence and the fact that he will never, ever, 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 ever be allowed ever. to get out of prison, <laughs> ever, ever. The decision was made that a bulletin them would not stand trial for the other stabbings and murders. Those charges were later dismissed because the cost of trial outweighed the fact that he is already in prison for life. So now we're going to get into where are they now? Tell us, Beth. Abulazam is alive and serving his life sentence without the possibility of parole for the murder of Arnold Minor. He attempted to appeal back on October 8th, 2015, 
but was denied on January 16th, 2008. Denied. Denied. <laughs> forever, 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 ever, ever. Forever, ever. <laughs> yes, bitch. Forever. <laughs> on May 2nd, 2017, Abu Lazam confessed to a 2009 murder in Leesburg, Virginia. So another one. Another one. Another uh, one. Uh, Q, uh, Q DJ Khaled. Here I go. Another one. Yeah. So he is currently serving time at Iona Correctional Facility in Michigan. At this facility, security consists of two 12-foot wire fences. This facility has everything. <laughs> with incorporate, which incorporate a stun fence, razor ribbon, gun towers, security surveillance cameras, and a alarm system for staff throughout the facility. Wow. Your prisoners are going to love it. <laughs> in, close, <laughs> in close officer stations, separate each wing and a patrol vehicle with armed personnel constantly patrols the prison perimeter so the prisoners will never get lonely. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I I don't think Abulazam will be getting out of there ever, 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 <laughs> ever, ever. So, oh boy, now it is time. It is time, y'all, for our takeaways. Hit it, Bev. <laughs> So I, I don't know why this guy did what he did and why he chose mostly black men. But I keep on thinking mm. about at the beginning of the script when we were talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and how yeah. hopelessness can lead to violence. Yes. So uh, some acquaintances and family said that he seemed lost, like he didn't know what to do with his life. He was obviously filled with anger, but exactly where that anger came from, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of strife in uh, yeah. Israel. Um, yeah. in that area so you know and generational too. generational you too. know yeah you yeah uh we've talked about the studies with mice before and, yeah yeah um and how it's evident in humans as well right and so even though he may not have directly experienced trauma of um his ancestors right. or um his the people who came before him uh it's kind of still there in yeah. his cells and genes and stuff right right um, and, and he did stab someone in Israel before he started his spree. It's like he stabbed somebody in Israel and then he came to mm -hmm. the U.S. and then it was all stab, 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 stab. <laughs> like stabbing every stabbing night. Mixed, stabbing yeah. mixed yeah. And he did. Yeah. And he liked it. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, he really did. And uh, yeah. it, just like how he would watch them after he stabbed them. Oh, like he just yeah. really liked stabbing. And yeah. I, I don't know why, but there you are. Yeah. And um, oh my we, gosh. we were talking about this case the other day. Um, we were like messaging each other and, yeah. and Minnie was in the conversation. And uh, mm -hmm. Minnie thinks it, wa it was racially motivated and that the yeah. one white victim was an anomaly. She feels yep. like Abu Lazam was trying to kill a part of himself and he was choosing mm. people of color because he is also a person of color. He chose mm -hmm. to stab, which is the intimate way of attacking because it was very mm -hmm. personal, emotional. And maybe mm -hmm. he saw himself in the victims that he chose. People who are treated as second class citizens in their own country. She said, quote, I think if I were to pinpoint one key factor in this case, it would be anti Arab sentiment. I think it's telling that Jews that are of Arab descent tend not to want to refer to themselves as Arab, like they want to dissociate themselves from that. And yeah. when you say the word Arab, I think most people in North America immediately think Muslim. And I think yeah. that anti-Muslim sentiment goes way back to the time of the Crusades. And yeah. I think a lot of people don't even know that there are nope, they Arab don't. Christians. They don't. Which is... Listen, yeah. listen to the, look at the comment section of any, anything. Any, anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they don't. Yeah. And uh, Abu Lazam's family was Arab Christian. Mm -hmm. And there is definitely anti-Arab sentiment in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Lots of it. There's plenty. There's plenty, plenty to, to go, go around. Yeah. Um, I I agree with your assessment, Beth, and with Minnie's to Minnie's point about the um intimate way of attacking. Yeah. I wonder if the personal and emotional attack is more cathartic than 
like I'm shooting sure, somebody. Yeah. And it, and just how he would stab them too was And watch. Yeah. Yeah. Watch. Like if there was yeah. some sort of release, even though it, it, it's not sexual in any way, there's he's getting something, something out, out of it. it. Yeah. Um and I am just I'm just it is a lot yeah um also the self-hate and dissociation is real in a world where there is global hatred and persecution of your existence be it um arab jewish black female um to protect yourself you might deny who you are when others identify you as that so you know cut to i'm not black i'm oj right i'm not black i'm dominican or i'm not this i'm that right um and there uh there was an allegation that he had paranoid schizophrenia and but I think that was debunked because of the pattern and the planning. Right. Um, but, th- you know, I, I, I don't know we could we, if we could completely rule out that there was some sort of something. Some happening. kind of psychosis or something. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, it was so sudden and the spree was so um, intense for such a short period of time. Yeah. That I wonder what that there's was about. definitely some kind of mental health stuff going on. It just didn't. Yeah. Come to They weren't able to use an insanity defense. That doesn't mean that he wasn't totally fucked up, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And then the the irony of him working at a mental health facility before all this happening is is interesting to me. Yeah, it is. Um, Time and place also is interesting because Flint has a high black population um, related to its ties in the Great Migration, which we didn't get into in this case. Um, But it had a lot to do. There's a lot of black people there because of the fleeing from racial terror in the South and the economic opportunity that was available in places like Michigan and Ohio. Why? (laughs) Uh, But anyway, what if what if these were what if I don't believe this, but what if they were just crimes of opportunity um, and not racially motivated uh, just for a second hang with me there because there was so many black people in these areas most of the areas that he um, committed these crimes and it just happened to be that he needed to kill and the bodies available at the time um, that he wanted to, with his desire to harm someone were black bodies. Yeah. It's Um, it's possible. It's definitely possible. The only thing that um, kind of doesn't make sense is Virginia um, because that the population was like 83% white there. So right. That, that, yeah, that debunks that. Yeah. And, but there, in, in my research, it seemed like there were some hard efforts to shift the narrative from this being hate crimes to something else right. real quick. And uh, it it's um, it's not unusual. Um, it just it, but I notice it. And yeah. that's all I'll say about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, uh, when violent crimes happen in BIPOC communities, usually the blame is shifted onto the community for just existing right. instead of on the individuals. So that plays into why it took 11 stabbings yeah. for, for it, the police yeah, to be like, cause, wait a minute. Because <laughs> that was the other thing. So you were talking about how most homicides there um, were gu- through gun violence and not stabbing. Yeah. And stabbings were really unusual, but it took 11 stabbings for them yeah. to put it together. <laughs> this is a really grim um, analogy, but you know, like when you are in your house and like you kill a fruit fly and you're like, oh, so another one bites the dust. Right. Good riddance. Um, just another one. Good. G- yeah. G- I'm glad I got another one. Yeah. And sometimes I wonder if that is how like white America and law enforcement looks at Black I'm sure some of people. them do. I always go back to that documentary Unseen where the market guy was like, yes, oh, yes. he's just taking out the garbage, you know? Yes, you're right. Yeah. I always and go so, back to that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do too. It's a, it's, but that is, that's the truth sometimes about how what people see yeah. what, yeah, how people see um, black and brown bodies and um, black and brown disgusting. victims. And it is disgusting and um, all those things. But I, I, it, it's just something that um, crossed my mind right. um, that these communities were more susceptible and more vulnerable to harm. And when something, but when something, happen to them like harm um it, they it was seen as their fault or it's just somebody taking out the trash and that's kind of why it was allowed to continue for so for longer than right, normal right, right. um and those are my thoughts now it's time to get into how not to get murdered so if you love true crime and you don't want to die here's a tip for you <laughs> 
<laughs> this segment is not intended to be victim blaming. We thought of this segment because I read somewhere that a lot of people listen to true crime because they want to know what they can do to be safer. This is not meant to blame the victims. It's just learning from other people's experiences. I feel like this tip was fate because I was listening to a podcast, Tig Notaro, and she um, was talking about a book about fear by some guy. I didn't catch the name, but essentially it's um, when you ignore your feelings of fear, you you in danger, girl. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So don't be polite and listen to your gut. And so there, I also just Googled that. Listen to your gut. Yeah. Uh-huh. This video popped up basically in the tune of if you're happy and you know it. So it okay. goes, All right. don't be polite to men who creep you out. <laughs> don't be polite to men that creep you out. Don't be polite to them. It's not your job to comfort them. Don't be polite to men that creep you out. <laughs> <laughs> and the the mom on the internet who taught this tune to her girls got mixed reviews. Like some critics called it toxic oh, femininity, geez. but I and just uh, okay. Maybe there's room for that criticism. Maybe I don't know, but I do think it is a good reminder. If your spidey sense is off. Don't ignore it. Yeah. You're a danger girl. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> just for the sake of comforting somebody yeah. else. Yeah, and, and so. women are taught to be polite and we are taught uh-huh. that uh, we should be nice to men. So mm-hmm. I think it's legit. Uh, toxic I, femininity. Uh, <laughs> Get out of here. Don't be polite to men. And we can change it to folks or people. Don't be, be polite, polite to, to people who, that creep you yeah, out. Yeah. So, I mean, folks, teach it to think, everybody. Don't, yeah. don't be, be polite, polite to folks that creep you out. Don't be be polite to folks that creep you out. <laughs> See? Right, yeah. Oh it works. Gosh. It works. I already feel like the world is a better place. Um, I and, like it. Uh, not necessarily that all the victims in this case were in that position, but I do think after hearing all of these instances in this uh, Bulazam matter, um, I think that is a good reminder yes, to take away from I this case. I think so, too. Have anything to add? I don't. You're a danger girl. <laughs> 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 I can't remember. I know that's Whoopi Goldberg, but yes. I can't remember what it's from. It's from Ghost. It is. I th- <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think you so. You're a danger girl. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I just so love Whoopi she- Goldberg. <laughs> Me too. Mm. Oh my God. Oh my God. Everything Whoopi Goldberg did. When I was a child, I was like, I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. be a nun. I'm going to be a lounge singer. Oh, what, I'm going to be that? a psychic. What was the, I'm going to be. What was the movie she was with uh, Ray Liotta? Oh, Karina, Karina. Yes. Underrated we movie, my friend. One of my favorites. Over again. Oh, we watched mine it so too. many times. Blowing yeah. the stoplight. Yeah, yeah. It was just, uh, I'm getting, oh, I'm getting cool. chill bumps right now. Me too. Oh, my Me God. Too. Rest in peace, mm-hmm. Ray Liotta. Yoda. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Such a good movie. <sighs> Yeah, you and Danger Girl. So, um, <laughs> so now we're going to get into the shout out portion of our show where we shout out any content by any BIPOC people, any marginalized folks or about any of those folks and or, or any true crime goodies. Um, I have two true crime goodies. Pretend podcast. Okay. It is. Hang on. I have to look it up because I just found it the other day after I saw Jerry, the FBI lady. Oh, yeah. Shout it out. And it's a podcast. It's a true crime podcast um, about um, con artists. But they uh, I've listened to episodes about hypnotism, um, whether that's a con or not. And hypnotism used in murder trials. What the fuck? Um, Basically, it's about people pretending to be stuff they're not. Oh, my God. The criminality of it. It is fascinating and the host is i believe a latinx okay man subscribe um, and it's really really great and uh the other podcast is on their behalf and on their behalf is a true crime podcast that pod sauce named they also named us too and our <laughs> friends at affirmative murder um one of eight true crime podcasts from black creators all about marginalized murderers Murder. serial killers and victims and on their behalf is focused on highlighting stories that didn't get their airtime or media attention specifically BIPOC, LGBTQ+, and others. And um, they work to represent the stories that the media doesn't. Uh, so that All is right. also a good Very show. Very cool. Uh, so what do, you, what do you got? So um, I, I haven't really been, I haven't found any anything new mm. recently. But I have been watching uh, The Leftovers, a TV <gasps> show. It's on Girl. HBO Max. And uh, really enjoying it. So 
Yeah. Yes. I thought yes, so. I, I thought it was like a Christian show because it's about huh? some people, uh, like something like two percent of the world, the people in the world just disappear. And they know style. Yeah. And they, yeah, they think it's like the 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 rapture. The rapture. Yeah. So people think uh-huh. it's the, some people think it was the rapture, and the stories are about the people that are left behind. That's why it's called the leftovers. Yeah. So I thought it was a Christian show, and I was like, that's not my bag. So I didn't watch it but then that work told me to watch it he's like he told me to watch it too <laughs> that, and, I, and, and and that's why i watched it it's yeah, so good it is really he has good amazing taste yeah in programming yeah he's always but got something know. for me to watch oh. he's like oh he's the one that told me to watch the americans oh my god how is he doing i tell him i said hello yeah he's doing good yeah <laughs> good good oh my god yeah his so, recommendations are on gold. point yeah. I, he, i've not had one bad one nope. and the leftovers is an excellent it program. is really good it feels kind of like a cross between lost and uh six feet under <laughs> yeah except i don't know if it was it, it it didn't fall victim to the tv writer strike like lost did oh, and so right yeah, Not don't tell me what happens. I it. haven't I haven't finished it yet. So <laughs> wait, you're still gonna try to finish Lost, Fred? Oh, not Lost. Uh, the Leftovers. Oh, the Left. I was gonna yeah, say no. Don't, I, I you watched, watched the girl. Don't do it. <laughs> I watched Lost and was very disappointed at the ending. Yeah. 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 Um. So the Leftovers is excellent. Yeah. So that's all I got today. Okay. So that is the Leftovers on HBO Max excellent show and pretend podcast wherever you get your podcast and also on their behalf another true tr- true crime podcast wherever you get your podcast right on. oh my god this has been so much fun yeah. my friend but that's it for today in the meantime where can the people find us our website is fruitloopspod.com and we use fruit loops pod for all of our social media join our discussion group on facebook at facebook pod discussion if you want to support the show you can send us a donation on the cash app just google fruit loops pod cash app or you can become a monthly patron through patreon this will help us pay for things like our website and pod hosting there's no minimum and no commitment even a dollar would help and as always we have merch for sale on our website oh my gosh patreon just started a thing you don't have to do monthly donations oh I guess you, can, you just can just do one, do one time. time right on one and done yeah right on. um so awesome well this is a weekly podcast and new episodes drop every thursday so until next time look alive y'all it's crazy out there